Welcome to the Fantastic Story Society. A place for the most unusual stories and storytellers. Including your Masters of Ceremony, Max Tim, and Scott Marcus. Alright, welcome everybody. This is the Fantastic Story Society. I'm kind of pumped and jazzed about the title, if, if nothing else. But i um, excited to be launching our episode zero, as we're calling it. This is our opening episode of a brand new podcast that myself and reveal scott marcus oh, my scott, long yes i am reveal. behind door number one <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're doing this together co-hosting um we've had this idea for a little while that we kind of wanted to have some form of a paranormal oriented storytelling podcast and we could have just titled it that but then you know how do people tell everybody hey i'm listening to the low and take some five minutes to say the title but that's what we're trying to do uh, i have a storytelling background obviously scott of course does too but scott has that uh, paranormal background a lot more than i do but uh, that's a, a you know needless to say but this is going to be both been fascinated we've yeah. both been fascinated by the unknown and the spooky and the the skin crawly paranormal for as long as we can remember and you know yeah. We, we've known each other since I guess it was 2002. Well, ish, 2001, 2002. Mm-hmm. We were each other's first roommate when we moved to Los Angeles in 2002, yep. and I think it was since day one we just loved telling stories. Wh- whatever the story was, it was usually around yeah, some kind of haunted ghost story kind of thing. <laughs> um, but I do want to make the disclaimer that we're calling it the Fantastic Story Society because we want to have, A, everybody involved. We'd love to hear your stories and social media, etc., and we'll get there. Fantastic stories. So it's not just going to be about ghosts only. That'll probably usually be the, the focus, but we're going to try to get some other amazing stories, cryptids, um, archaeology. Scott has an amazing friend named Dan Malone, who's, who's an archaeologist, and he's gone on some amazing adventures. So it's going to be all encompassing with maybe a little bit of an emphasis on scary things. But on and that I, note, though, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I do want to point out, though, that this is about telling those stories. It's right. not just about, like, we'll never have, and no offense to these people, but that's not what the show is about, we'll never have a team of ghost hunters on to talk about their findings or anything like that. We're going to have people on that are storytellers, whether they're creating things for the screen or doing their own unique podcast and finding unique spins on how to tell a story in different medium. So it's about telling these types of stories and getting into the folklore and urban legends and history and all that. But there are so many wonderful paranormal podcasts out there that are all about interviewing the paranormal experts. We're about talking with the expert storytellers within this field. Yeah. And, you know, there may be some guests on here that, have, of course, performed investigations and they may very well be experts. But we want to learn about them. We want to learn about why and how they tell their stories. Um, you know, one of our initial little kind of um, tentative titles was uh, something along the lines of, you know, fantastic stories and how to find them. But it was just a little too close to Harry Potter. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, a little too close. But uh, the how is really, you know, what we're, we're looking for. We, we there are going to be some really great stories shared regardless, just because of the nature of the show and because of who we bring on as guests. This episode is just going to be you and me, Scott, chatting around. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe we'll start there. Like what What really – I had this thought early on and maybe I'm going to stump you a little bit because I didn't warn you. But um, <laughs> How unprofessional. <laughs> do you <laughs> – You treat yeah. all your guests like this? No. Yeah, it's better to improv anyway. Yeah. But was do you remember like your earliest moment of a story that really affected you, whether it was a book or even something you experienced? I guess I'll, I'll say that the first thing that really, I mean, there's so many. So I did a, a very amateurish documentary when I was 18 on Haunted Chicago. And I, I was really fascinated by all of it, I guess, just every aspect of it. I was not a lifelong ghost person. I, it's kind of funny that I wasn't really all into ghost stories, uh, more than the average person, uh, until even after I did the documentary on the topic. But at one point I was learning about this part, this area in Chicago that's nicknamed death's alley. And it was, it's this alley that to this day runs behind, uh, uh, one of the grand theaters in downtown. Oh, it's like literally an alley. It's yeah, it's literally an alleyway. During the Iroquois Theater fire, nineteen oh three, there was I don't have my notes in front of me, but I'm it was hundreds upon hundreds of people died in this theater fire. I think and I've seen that on some like ghost investigation shows. 
I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Uh, it was even more tragic than those sheer horrifying numbers, but it was at, around the holidays. So kids were home from school. So many, many, many of the dead were like kids and their mom. So this alleyway ended up being just full of bodies because the fire escapes weren't in place yet or just recovering all of the bodies and piling them up there. Right, yeah. So now you come to today and there are thousands of people probably every day that walk down this alleyway not knowing the macabre history there. And that was something that really resonated with me, that there's history there. And there are ghost stories, of course, associated with it. And and maybe people witness something, maybe they don't. But they're walking in this really important area that doesn't even have a plaque, doesn't have any anything there to remind people of what happened there, this really important moment. And they really were like brought to this alley by somebody or how did that happen? For me, I I was just doing all sorts of research. And this was one location I found in a book and thought, well, I have to go there. And I don't know. I think it was just for me, it's telling telling stories from history that we all should know that. How do we not know that? Like, I'm outraged that I didn't know this until now. Right. And that's kind of one of the also great things about ghost stories is sometimes the 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 history, the ghosts, whatever you want to call whatever energy is out there. Uh, it kind of makes sure that you don't forget. Certain There's things. a make sure you don't forget, but that that is what connects us to the story. You could tell this crazy story about the chupacabra. Like I think the chupacabra is kind of cool, but I yeah. have no real connection to it. I, you know, historically speaking, it goes back to like 1995 or, you know, it's not like it's this ancient story necessarily. Um, but then there, you know, those cryptid like stories of Bigfoot and the Yeti and all these things are to me, it's just interesting. And I love hearing and studying some of that, but it doesn't necessarily connect me to something as much as that story of the York theater and these poor people there. There's a yeah. human element in there. But you were so you grew up in the Chicago area. We can kind of talk about our backgrounds just for people listening who don't know who we are. <laughs> grew up in <laughs> Chicago as a White Sox fan, which I won't hold against you. <laughs> Also paranormal because I'm from the north side. So that's true. <laughs> and you grew up in Wisconsin as a Bears fan. So yeah, also I paranormal. was a Bears and Cubs fan and Bulls fan and uh, yeah, Bears fan in the in the Brett Favre era in Wisconsin was awful. It was really Warwick. terrible. And of course, the Cubs were always terrible in my my youth. Um, and I've been reveling in the past few years. But uh, we're both from the Midwest. You know, Scott and I grew up probably within an hour of each other, never, you know, met each other. But um, until uh, we went to Columbia College, Chicago. But even then, we didn't meet until we moved to Los Angeles because we were set up as roommates together. Yeah, it's so funny because, I mean, you you grew up, Max, in one of the most I, I always I tell everybody about where you grew up because it's such a unique place. And I always say, like, Stephen King wouldn't uh, dare to write a setting so like over the top because it's so ridiculous. ridiculous. But yeah. I remember even as a child, apparently being next door to you as I went as a kid to the Clown Hall of Fame, which was oh, you on did. That, yes. <laughs> what? So, I, yes, I can't let's back up. mentioned that. I, I think I have at one point, but it was maybe a very late night around the campfire as as we did yeah, right, many, right. many, many a time. Um, but yeah, we should we should talk, touch on why we're talking about the Clown Hall of Fame right now. <laughs> right. So Scott grew up in Mundelein, Illinois, which is the northwest north suburb of Chicago. I grew up in the uh, Delavan, Wisconsin, which is right next to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Lake Geneva is a little bit more well known. However, ironically, Delavan has a famous name. We had um, our own national stamp. <laughs> ah. Our town we had a stamp. Now you've made it. <laughs> yeah, that was like 1980 something. But um, the reason we got the stamp is kind of what segues into the whole history of the town of Delavan, Wisconsin. It's in the southeast corner of the state, um, and it was uh, it's about an hour and 20 minutes north from Chicago, and then about 45 to 50 minutes south of Milwaukee, and then almost an hour south of Madison. So we were kind of right in this little middle area. And the reason that was important back in the early 1900s was because the circus was really big in the country. And, you know, not too often or much at all would circuses go west of the Mississippi. And therefore, there were these three primary uh, uh, circuses before they combined. And of course, I wish I could name them all, but it was like Ringling Brothers, and then Barnum was separate, and then the Bailey Brothers or something. Eventually, Barnum and Bailey came together. But Mm -hmm. those three circuses would be, you know, one in Madison, one in Milwaukee, one in Chicago, for example. And during the winter, they would meet in my little hometown of about 7,000 people. At the time, it was much, much smaller. 
and just stay there all winter. No circuses were actually ever performed <laughs> in our town. Um, but it was dubbed the circus capital of the country in the early 1900s. So from there, there was, you know, buildings constructed to house all these circus people and then put all the animals in certain places. And <clears throat> so it became this little circus town, literally, uh, over the winter for, I think it was only a short time, maybe 10 years. Like, I don't think it lasted that long. But okay. The elephants, if they if they died or any other animals, they would just dump them in the lake behind the house that I grew up in. <laughs> Man alive! And there are still elephant bones in the bottom of the lake. But t- today, you know, to try to try to bring us current, um, and, and there's a whole story about Harry Houdini when he first ran away from home. He stayed in the hotel that is, you know, still standing in my hometown. Um, but and he, I think he was like 12. He stayed in the basement. Yeah. Where I grew up, it was one of the first houses built in the town. We were, lived in this house for 25, 26 years. And it was always commercially zoned. It always had all these different businesses run out of them, uh, out of it from uh, um, a restaurant to a boarding house for many years. I think it was almost 50 years. It was a barbershop and a beauty salon right before we moved in. When we moved in, it had it was like the sign was still on the side of the house. <laughs> Beauty yeah, song. Wow. Old ladies would still come over, knock <laughs> the door, like, I'm here for my, and my mom's like, uh, we don't really. Uh, do uh, you got to call ahead, no walk-ins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was also used as a, a funeral home where they would actually hold wakes for people. I mean, this is a 120-year-old house. But across the street, when I grew up, when I was very little, probably up until... It was 12, 13 when it finally left was the Clown Hall of Fame, what Scott was talking about. And it was this little building. Like, it wasn't anything magnificent, but inside was like the history of clowning, whatever you want to call that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we haven't grown up since, you know? Yeah, right. And then down the street, literally down a block, not even, what is our it was tiny main square park if you want to call it a park it was pretty small but it was our water tower park the water tower it was in the middle of the park and there was this giant is still a giant statue of an elephant named romeo standing on its hind legs with its arms up uh and then in between its legs uh is a clown just waving and smiling and i only learned i think it was even from you maybe that romeo was made famous because i think he it was at least three people that he killed because he was pissed off all the time, and he stomped on these people. <laughs> oh, so man. Delvin decided to erect a statue with someone standing between his legs, which is, still boggles my mind. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there's that statue, and then there's another statue of a draft, like 20 feet to its right. Um, and then all the drinking fountains are open in town are open mouths of lions. You stick your head in and get the water. So it's, it was just a really weird town to live in. It's not like the whole town looked like a circus or anything, but it did have some throwback stuff about it and you know the town still celebrates its circus history and it's wild that, that's amazing and i'm actually looking right now at a photo of a plaque which actually is on the romeo base i guess but yeah 26 total circus companies and we are looking at the mid 1800s here so we're, okay. we're going way back i was wrong okay so then it lasted up until maybe the 1900 year or something possibly between 1847 1894 delvin was okay. home to 26 different companies so yeah up to the late 1800s um, and it starts with the the Maybe Brothers. That's M A B I E. Okay. Uh, Maybe Brothers U.S. Olympic Circus at the time the largest in America arriving here in 1847. So they were the ones that really kicked it off. Thank you for fact checking that. <laughs> there's, that's, a, that's, there's a plaque and, that I could have easily walked to and read maybe once yeah, in my life. That's, yeah. So that was my little hometown, and I, you know, the the house I grew up in was directly across the street on my little cul-de-sac of the original graveyard of all yeah. the founding people that you know first lived in town. There was probably 45 headstones, and the founding fathers, so-called, are in that graveyard uh, and, and we, I lived literally across the street from it. my poor sister Carrie who uh, was always very sensitive to ghosts and hauntings and things um, was given the room that had a beautiful big picture window that looked right out over the graveyard so she had to grow up with that hanging over her head much less other things hanging over her head that we can get to but yeah that house gonna, was very haunted and, I just couldn't uh, imagine being our age growing up in this town and the and the TV series miniseries it comes out, yeah. Just to oh my gosh, you, if you had a clown thing, you just it would have to move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it was it was a uh, oh my god, that's a whole other podcast. But um, we can get back to my haunted house because yes, some of those we have to, we fun. must. Um, but so you, it's interesting that you were more interested in the history of things, and then you slowly became interested in different types of hauntings because that's always fascinated me. For when well, I was younger, growing up, I was like, it's a ghost, is a ghost. It, it's interesting, and I've always liked scary stuff. You know, I, I remember the summer I discovered Stephen King as like a 10 year old or something like that. And I just couldn't get enough of watching movies that scared me. And and eventually it was more so the ghost side of things. I remember one night and this was, I guess, my origin story here. It was the summer after I graduated. Some friends and I were we, you know, we're 18 years old. We live in the suburbs. There's nothing to do. You can't go to a bar. And there's just nothing to do. While we were trying to figure out what we were going to do with ourselves for the night, somebody started to tell a ghost story. And then somebody else told one. And and, and for all of us, it was, nobody had their own stories. It was Those just like, best hey, nights. yeah, this is this is something I saw on Unsolved Mysteries. Wouldn't that be creepy? And, right. you know, this is around the time of the Blair Witch Project as well. It was amazing. There was a moment where I kind of like stepped outside of the, the moment. And I was just able to see just how passionately everybody was telling these stories that none of us had personal connections to. Like, could you imagine how much more amped up this would be if we knew what we were talking about at all? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and that night, and so first off, we started telling ghost stories, I think around 10 or uh, 9 or 10 at night. And the first time anybody stopped to look at the clock, it was four in the morning. Like, <laughs> holy hell we've been they telling the founding stories. founding people of the fantastic story society <laughs> yeah exactly and i remember it was so funny because i was at a friend's house and i had to drive two of my other friends home which would have meant that one person would have to sit alone in the back seat and nobody wanted to do that so we sat three exactly. across in the front row yeah. <laughs> but that night i thought i need to i need to research i need to like what what's the deal with ghost stories why do we love this so much and are there really any haunted places around? I, I was I didn't know anything about ghost stories other than fun stories I'd heard, but like the the bones and foundations and the the real information here. And I picked up a book by Ursula Bielski, which had come out fairly recently in the late '90s, called Chicago Haunts. And uh, I bought it the next afternoon, and I began to read. And I only got a handful of chapters in before I thought I need to start visiting these places. I was so excited yeah, by you it. You live so close to them. Yeah, like because I thought the book, I thought the entire book was going to be do ghosts exist or not? Like, here's compelling evidence either way. And it was more so like, okay, here's what happens at this place. And if you go with here this time, this is what you can observe. And it was just so matter of fact. And the, the idea that there's way more haunted places around me than I ever knew about. And it was mo way more commonplace than I ever would have expected. So that's what made me say, okay, I need to go to these places. And I do, even at this younger age, I would already been making like, bad, uh, fun movies on my own as a kid. Like, well, I'm going to go out there with a camera. I'm going to bring the friends from our uh, little storytelling session, and we're going to spend our summer visiting haunted places in Chicago and turn it into a documentary. And that's how I spent the summer after graduating high school and just had a blast doing it. Well, what's great is that the it was, there's like innovation behind that because that hadn't really been done yet. No. Yeah, the, I think the this first. was long before Ghost Adventures got big and all the shows and stuff. Yeah, Ghost Hunters with you know uh, Grant and Jay kind of really the the show credited with kicking off the whole Ghost Hunter phenomenon and the paranormal TV shows and all that. That didn't start for five more years. That didn't start until two thousand four. Right. So this was I don't think ghost hunting was a phrase. It definitely wasn't a phrase I knew yet. And we definitely weren't out trying to find evidence, but we were just going out on location to cover the stories and interview people that may witness something. We just wanted to see these places for ourselves. And that's that was the impetus of it. And it just kept growing from there. And we quickly learn how much people love telling ghost stories. Yeah. Like everybody, you could go anywhere and go, so you got a ghost story? And they're like, oh, well, I at least heard this one thing. And then yeah. bam, you're off and running. Something that I, I really loved, and I, I learned this fact early on, is that only about one third of Americans believe in ghosts. Really? And some people think that's a huge number. Some people think that's a small number. <laughs> I started getting booked to give speeches in libraries and community places and whatnot around Halloween. And I would, for a long time, I asked the question, who here believes in ghosts? And even at an event that's about telling ghost stories, that number rang true. Only about a third of the audience would put their hand up. Wild. You got to wonder how many people in the audience though were like, eh, I don't know if I want to raise my hand. I mean, it's possible. But even if we say it's 50-50, 
then I found that uh, inspiring, actually, yeah. that even people that don't believe in ghost stories still love to hear a good ghost story. Yeah. And this podcast isn't, you know, about trying to convince yeah. anybody of anything. If you don't believe, great. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a skeptical believer is kind of how I, I pin myself down even after growing up for 23 or however many years. I think it was 25. <laughs> I, yeah. like, I don't remember. Um, in a haunted house. Like, it was legitimately freaking haunted man like there there were too many things that would happen too often that were unexplainable in this house and so but even i who you know as i got older through college and out of college i just you know got more involved with listening to your stories and what you do and then i watch as many of the ghost investigation shows as i possibly can just because i think it's hilarious (laughs) Um, and it's entertainment and most of the time i'm like come on I hate, yeah. you know, when, when, when they're like, oh, I feel something. I'm like, I don't, yeah, you know, like, I don't, what do <laughs> you mean? That does not translate to the living room. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it, it adds some suspension and tension. All right, fine. But the things that are difficult to explain, that's what I'm waiting for. And then bam, I'm like, okay, let's look at that. That's cool. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that is where I think the, the impetus of fantastic story comes from. Fantastic is above expectation, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And and that's where we're going with it, with regardless of the field we're going to be talking about. It's just some wild stories. Like one thing I remember you telling me about how I think it was your friend Dan Malone found out that one of these circuses way back when um, sticking on the circus theme mm-hmm. uh, had a, a train car that spilled an Egyptian mummy. <laughs> This was a a, chur- a a circus that went out of business while they were traveling through Chicago. Right. And they, just and they had dumped. kind of a, a sideshow type of thing. And now, well, they've got these assets that they're – I don't even know if they had – they were going to liquidate things. They were just done. So they had a couple of actual Egyptian mummies that they just needed to get rid of. So they buried them in a forest preserve in Chicago. <laughs> so right now, <laughs> to this day – and and there's – it's – so hard to find any real solid information because we are again talking 1800s and it's talking about covering something up too so it's really even more difficult there's a chance at least and we're this is one of the many stories that dan and i are are working to to get to the bottom of is are there actual egyptian mummies buried somewhere in chicago yeah and hopefully hopefully the answer is yes because that would be cool but hopefully we can also recover them and then then there's a whole new life to these corpses let's be honest totally getting them back to egypt or whatever would happen with them next yeah yeah oh god i hope they're still intact if they are real but anyway it's those things that just always inspires us and it just excites us when we hear wild stories like that of course you you go toward the ghost thing because it's so mysterious and but there's emotion involved too because a good scare is always really fun growing up in that haunted house i didn't have nearly as many experiences as two of my sisters i had three older sisters um i was the youngest my mom was always home. My dad was we worked his butt off, kind of you know typical Midwestern family. Yeah. But two of my three sisters had many more experiences than I did, and my sister Trina, who's the oldest. Trina and I are probably most alike, and then the middle sisters are probably a little closer in terms of you know uh, alikeness, if that is a word. Nonetheless, Trina and I had some experiences. I had one experience that I'll never forget, which really solidified you know my belief that okay, yeah, the house is something else, but. Uh, <laughs> Carrie, my poor sister Carrie, was the closest in age to me. I want to go into every detail, so I'll try. But um, yeah, I, I really want you to. Uh, as I'm directing here, um, yeah. and I, I think those little details for me, when it comes to writing and and writing a great scary story, yeah. uh, environment is everything. I mean, just think of the others where you know you can only have you can't have any light coming into the house. Right, right, There's right. all these odd little rules and little quirks of a location. I think can make a place so chilling and. It's one of the quirks of the house you grew up in that I always find fascinating. Well, and those are the things that, you know, that's one of the reasons we have this podcast is going into the why the stories can be so compelling and little details like that. Like you said, it really helps. Um, So setting the stage, my house was basically a giant square, almost rectangle. And by giant, I mean, I think it was it was probably about 3000 square feet. It was a big old house. It was big. Yeah. Had a whole bunch of. Like it, it would, it was the opposite of of open concept, <laughs> rooms all over the place. But what was fascinating about upstairs, and it's something that you know, I when I was three years old, I think is when we moved in. Uh, my parents sold the house. I think when I was like twenty 
five or no, no, it was probably older than that. But nonetheless, we were there for a long time, but I was very young. So I just, you know, as a three year old, I just accept the house. It was this big, pretty house and big entryway with the nice you know, wraparound staircase in the front, right at when you open the door and to your right after you get into the entryway is a nice, big, beautiful dining room. And to your left is a, you know, living room. And, but then when you go upstairs, the stairs were right in the middle of the house. And then the bedrooms are all, all around the edges of it. Um, so there was nothing really in the middle. All the bedrooms were around the edges of it. But I remember growing up with these giant deadbolts on each of the bedroom doors. And those deadbolts were st- are still in the house. And I just never even thought anything. I'm like, whatever, this is just a lock. you know. But they were huge. <laughs> like, you really had to put some effort into turning these things. And I didn't even under- put it together. But my mom said, well, you know, it was a boarding house. Why do you think there were deadbolts in all the, the uh, bedrooms? So people would rent these rooms out. Over, I think there was, um, oh, no, I wish I could remember uh, her name. Uh, Tran. Mrs. Tran was a woman that owned the house um, for, it, I think it was at least 40 years and ran it as a boarding house up until, I think, like the 70s or something. So people were coming and going in this house for decades. So many, many people lived in, the, in that house. And, and there was one bathroom upstairs. So everybody shared that bathroom. You know, this was kind of typical in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And it, this, people did, you know. I just got used to this old house. And it made sounds. And I think the important thing for me to point out from a personal level, I was never terrified in the house. I was never scared. I loved that house. It was just yeah, warm and comforting. Great. And you know what I mean? And I had this, this complete obsession with Christmas at a young age uh-huh. where... I would sneak down into our horribly, you could argue, terrifying basement because I knew my parents were <laughs> were, were <laughs> hiding the the Christmas presents that they bought for us down in this basement. Like this place and, is too creepy for any kids to go down into, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what they thought. But I was like, whatever. <laughs> There's He-Man guys down there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it'd be like December 10th. You know, 25 days to her, 20 days till Christmas or whatever it is. Um, if I can do my math in my head, 15. Um yeah. And I would sneak down in the basement. I'd be like going through the Toys R Us bags and stuff. Not once was I remotely afraid of that basement. And this thing was dungeon. You know, this they had, we had like this potato room. Like they literally had just sand on the floor and they would have put potatoes back there. Um, now when we lived there. And yeah. then there was a, a giant well in the very foundation of the house that was... Oh somewhere. my gosh, it was the ring too. Jeez. Yeah. So I was just never scared. But my sister Carrie had a room in the middle of the, the house and so so-called, you know, you know, on the edge with big picture window, looked out over that graveyard. And um, she woke up one night and th- to preface this story a little bit is that during this time in her life, I think she was like, well, she was maybe 11, 12 or so. For a couple of years, she had little bouts with waking up in the middle of the night and walking in her sleep. And she would talk in like weird alien tongues and it would like she'd be walking really fast and she'd pound by my bedroom door. And I remember waking up like, please don't come in. It's really weird. I don't want you to talk to me when you're asleep. We never yeah. we were never really worried about it. You know, it just was what it was. Yeah, a little phase kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And my parents weren't concerned. Um, she did wake up a couple times like behind the TV and then like fall back asleep. <laughs> but, <laughs> so with this in mind, she woke up in the middle of the night. Her bedroom door was open. She looked out into the hall and uh, it was all dark. And she saw a, like a darker than dark shadow floating toward her bedroom and her feet were pointed toward the door, you know, so she was kind of, and she had to kind of lift her head up to look. She looked out and watched this thing float toward her room. And and she was like, screw that, you know, and she just got scared threw the blanket (laughs) over her head. And like any kid would do, like, I don't want to look at it. And she waited for what she says a pretty long time. And then she finally pulled the sheet back off of her head. And there was a woman, her face about five inches from my sister's face, looking down at her unreal long black flowing dress floating over her her bed and carrie lost it (laughs) just (laughs) screamed bloody murder it's the only reaction it's the only possible reaction (laughs) i mean it was at first so fear fear based that it was you know she's frozen and then just scream 11 year old scream and i remember waking up but so carrie ran into my parents room and of course she's not making any sense so my parents were like, oh, Carrie, just whatever, you know, okay, we, you know, go back to bed. So my poor 11-year-old sister had to somehow go back into that bedroom, <laughs> lay back down. So five years go by, 
and my mom's one of my mom's best friends. Uh, her name's Celeste. Very typical South Side of Chicago, no filter woman. Um, just says what's on her mind. We all loved her and still do, you know. And so she was coming over to stay for the weekend. And my mom and my sister Carrie were greeting her in our entryway, and you know they're saying their hellos. And Celeste has her suitcase, and Celeste asks, um, "So where am I going to be sleeping?" And my sister or my mom says, "You'll be up in in you know this one bedroom." And Celeste throws it out there, says, "Well, I hope it's not the room where this woman's floating over my bed." <laughs> <laughs> my mom was like, what? And Carrie immediately, it was like just buckets of tears immediately. And she was like, I told you because nobody's believed me for years. And, and Celeste was like, yeah, last time I stayed here, some woman, I woke up in the middle of the night, she's floating over my bed. <laughs> so that, you know, obviously corroborated the story. Um, and my mom was like, oh, no, whatever, you know. But she, my mom had had plenty of experiences in that house. And you'd spent how, a few nights. great night for Carrie there. that she was able to be present, even though maybe in that moment she couldn't understand so much. But, like, now looking back, like, yes, I was there and I, I got to be validated <laughs> right then and there. Yes, it had to have been validating. And Carrie doesn't really like talking about it. Like, Carrie was always the kind of person that she didn't even like looking at the covers, and she still is, but she doesn't like looking at the covers of, like, scary movies. Like, she can't look at a DVD cover and it's like, nope, don't want to look at it. Like, she's that sensitive, and of course, that moment made her even more sensitive. Um, and scarred. She- is the word yeah. totally scarred and and that house didn't help but you know there are multiple other stories that just every night probably somewhere between three and four in the morning you'd hear footsteps or what sounded like you know if somebody was holding a big bag of marbles dropped the bag and like the balls and marbles kind of spread out across a hardwood floor and if you were awake you'd hear it <laughs> and I remember coming home. I'm totally monopolizing this episode. But no, no, no. I, I wanted to make sure these come out because as we talked about in the pre-show, you know, we're not going to be able to get into our own stories quite so much. So yeah. this is a great time that, you know, we want to let you guys know why why Max and I are the ones that are ideal hosts for this show is we both have a creepy history yeah. and we were both into writing. We both love when one of our biggest passions in life is telling stories in general. Yeah. But also we have some some paranormal baggage. <laughs> it's the yeah, we do have a paranormal baggage, but um, it's also just paying attention. Like my expertise is as a story consultant. I work with writers and I help them write stories. You know, so we break it down from a character level, structure, etc. I have my own consulting company. Scott and I both work for the International Screenwriters Association. So obviously, we have this love for stories. So telling them we could it, this could be a four hour podcast. My own personal experience in in that house. I had the, a corner uh, bedroom. I, w- I remember I was 22 years old. And the reason I remember this so vividly was because it was the summer of 2001. And it was when my buddies and I were in our, like, king of partying phase, like the whole summer. And I remember coming home at, like, it was 2.30 or so in the morning. And I specifically remember as I w- was creeping up these really rickety stairs that with every step made a sound, thinking... This is weird that I'm coming home this late and I'm sober. And I had like a little laugh. You know, I'm like, oh, it's kind of weird. And and I don't make a habit of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I still think that. No. Yeah. But uh, no, no, no. But at the time, my other sister, Aaron, was living with my parents and her son, Joey, was, I, I gosh, he might have been two, three at the time. And uh, he had my sister Carrie's old room. And he was sleeping in there. And, and so I got home at 2.30. So in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I don't, I don't want to wake up Joey. Um, so I'm creeping into my room. And I, it was just as I was laying down. So I'm absolutely 100% positive I was not asleep. Because I literally had just put my head on the pillow. And I heard on the other side of the house some movement, um, just basic noises. And it sounded like somebody had gotten up. And I was immediately thinking, I think I woke Joey up, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I hear some footsteps coming out from where Joey would have, you know, been coming out. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, every sometimes Joey would get up and walk past my room in order to get to my sister Aaron's room. And he would do that maybe once or twice a week and just go into my sister's room and sleep with her. So that's where my head was. I'm like, ah, whoops, you know, oh, well. And then as Joey's what I thought was Joe or Joey's feet walking down the upstairs hall toward my room turned into an all out adult sounding heel to the floor sprinting mm-hmm. like this was something was wrong running as hard and fast as, as a, an adult can run. Yeah. It, it immediately switched to that. And I 
I still get goosebumps just talking about it because I actually sat up in bed, like kind of pushing my body away from my bedroom door because I was my my head was relatively close to the bedroom door. And I thought, what's wrong? You know, I sat up in bed like, oh, my God, somebody's going to burst into my room. And those st- footsteps stopped right outside my door. They didn't continue down the hall. <laughs> Nobody yeah. knocked on my door. And I remember sitting there going, okay, there's one or two things, maybe three things. <laughs> We've got an adult who's just standing outside of my door right now, which is really weird. Yeah. <laughs> or we've got a ghost in my room because <laughs> it ran in here. Or a ghost is standing outside of my door. And I just remember thinking, okay, I don't know what that was. I don't know how to react to this. So I just laid back down and somehow fell back to sleep because it's good. Mm-hmm piss out of me and the next morning i kind of run it past my sister i'm like so did uh and i asked aaron did joey go into your room last night and aaron loves ghost stories to the point (laughs) where she wants to hear all of them especially when it was pertaining to the house Mm -hmm. um and she immediately goes no why (laughs) (laughs) tell me tell me tell me i'm like well good happened yeah and she has some crazy scary moments that she experienced in her own bedroom multiple whispers people talking about her as she was laying in bed um she tried hiding certain things overnight because certain objects would show up on her pillow the next morning even though she would hide it in the closet um i mean i could go into detail and if she's listening she's probably like why do you got to tell the whole thing but we're kind of running low on time but uh just wild stories about that house which i think is what connected me so much to storytelling at a young age um because i was just fascinated by curious things that you don't have an answer to, you know? Yeah. And it seems yeah. like that's where you're coming from too. Like, let's try to find what this truth is. That, I mean, it, it's, it's become that more and more, but I, I got to say that. So it was interesting. I, I got very fascinated with ghost stories. And once I began to appreciate history more as a result of those, that's when I was really completely hooked forever. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, and this is kind of a small one, but uh, Fort Sheridan on the north shore of Chicago, this beautiful, massive, old, old military base that was uh, Civil War, I think pre-Civil War era. uh, So it really, really dates back. And uh, when I was writing my book, so we're looking at the early 2000s at this point, it was a decommissioned military base. And I just happened to be in the area one night, late at night. I thought, like, well, let's see how close I can get. And I pulled up to the front gates. You were by yourself? I I was with Mary Serwinski, who was my research partner at the time. There was a guard tower, but the gate was up. And there was just a sign that said, if you enter these premises, you consent to having your vehicle searched. Well, fortunately, I dumped all my uh, automatic weaponry before I got here. Yeah, right. So I'll come right in. And uh, we just spent the entire night just slowly letting the car, almost in idle, just slowly go through this entire ghost town of this old military base. Wow. And there were all sorts of different compelling ghost stories associated with it. We didn't have a ghost story of our own. Nothing happened that night, but it was amazing to, to just be here alone in this place. Now, you cut to today, it's been renovated and all these old buildings are now condos and whatnot. And so it's a oh, high wow. end living. But there's a cemetery on premises and it just, again, the history is big. I, I knew the history, but it didn't resonate so much with me. And then eventually that fall, I was in a college history class and we're learning about the Civil War. And the professor is talking about Lieutenant General Philip Sheridan. And I put my hand up. I'm like, hey, is that Sheridan like Fort Sheridan? Oh, he yeah. said, yeah, that he, you know, after the Civil War, he was put in charge of this base at one point in time. And there's a a very famous road in Chicago, Sheridan Road, Mm -hmm. that goes into the city from the North Shore. And he said that road actually even has that name because after the city burned down and the Great Chicago Fire, 1871, there were fears of all sorts of rioting and looting. So Philip Sheridan marched his troops down into Chicago and the path they took, they named after him after that. Mm, Cool. What a... What a mind-blowingly awesome thing to know now. <laughs> and it, yeah. again, how many people drive on Sheridan like I have my whole life, not knowing why it has that name? And it's almost like every single town in the world, not yeah. almost like, but every town in the world has those little things where you're driving down a road and something amazing happened on that road. <laughs> yeah. But just kind of looking, what's the history of this road? You're, you're famous for that. You'll go anywhere, literally. 
and go, what's the history of this stupid little taco stand I'm at? And you're like, how about this story? You know? (laughs) Well, and the the other thing that, you know, especially when you grow up in an area, you just kind of take everything as it comes. You don't think about it. It just is. I still don't know the names of the roads in the town I grew up in. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) But like once I had that experience with, with Sheridan Road, then, you know, I'm in a new town. I'm like, hey, why is this called uh, instant death lane. Like, Oh, I would never thought about it. I don't know. <laughs> but It just, it just is like, no, there's a reason it was named right. that so let's dive into it. I, I've been basing so much on history, but really it is the, the, the mystery side of things that is so captivating to me. And Max, well, you were, why you wrote your book. I wrote my book because when I was doing the documentary, I uncovered too many great stories. There were so many good stories. And as a filmmaker, you realize you only have about 90 minutes of people's attention to sit down and watch something. And I had way, way, way more stories in me that I wanted to tell. The medium just didn't allow for it. Yeah. So then I wrote a book. And actually, this is far enough ago that I thought, hey, CD-ROM, this is going to be an amazing (laughs) CD-ROM. CD-ROM. Because I was so excited about that medium because then you could put videos in there and like all the pictures you want. You don't have to worry about page counts and whatnot. And eventually that fell out of favor. Nobody wants to sit and read uh, on their screen, which that's evolved as well by now. (laughs) Yeah. But. It's kind of the uh, fun thing looking back, just seeing how much has changed in the how we consume media but mm-hmm. now and when I began doing this in 19. Oh, my God. And it's not even that long. It really it's, is not all that long ago. It's just nuts. It's less than 20 years, technically speaking. But even if you're not a Chicagoan or from the Chicago area or even, you know, southeast Wisconsin, northwest Indiana or whatever. But Scott's book is really fun like those stories in there some of them are legendary you're like okay yeah you know you got uh, resurrection mary most people in the paranormal world who are interested in the paranormal have heard of that you know but you know, i didn't necessarily know that it originated in the chicago area and so it's basically called, vanishing hitchhiker vanishing you know. hitchhiker is very famous and that's on uh, archer road archer avenue and archer just avenue. Yeah. yeah but his book's called the voices from the chicago grave you should look that up they can still find that can't they yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Especially if you go to my website. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, what's your ghost story.com is my website. Yes. And you should go to what's your ghost story.com because everybody listening, I'm sure and pretty confident that you have a ghost story. Just share it on the website, man. You, got, you know, what the heck? Have some fun. Practice your storytelling ability. There are so many other stories I feel like we could tell. But, um, you know, th- I think it's going to come out. Basically, it will. as we go through future episodes, we're always going to have a guest on that we interview. Our first official guest that I, I personally am so stoked to get. But Jeff uh, Scott's known him for a while but his name's Jeff Belanger, lead researcher on Ghost Adventures since episode one. But he's so much more than that. He's just epic yeah. storyteller. Yeah, I mean, just you, you can add to that, Scott. What else yeah. about Jeff? Well, I would say exactly what you said. The fact that he is the original writer and researcher for the Ghost Adventures, which is the most popular ghost hunting show and or paranormal show of our lifetime. And that is not really, that doesn't begin to talk about who he is and what he does. Yeah. Because he, yeah. well before the show, was a paranormal writer and folklorist and researcher, not at all an investigator, but he was really always just fascinated with the stories. So the great thing about folklore and urban legends and those those stories that are associated with a town is all of these people that live in this town and that grew up in a town, it, it becomes part of the culture, what it means to live there. So even if there's not a history behind it, there's just a, a knowledge of it or a belief in it, it's something that that connects all of these people together. And so that's something that I find really important and fascinating. And Jeff is all about that. That I think is what really excites him the most. And so what he basically does for a living, he goes around and does speeches at different things. He focuses on the new England area. Um, he has a podcast called new England legends. Um, that's really fun. They're all about 10 minutes long and it's slightly f- like not fictionalized, but they hire actors and do a couple of, you know, yeah, it's dramatized, uh, dramatized is the way to say. It. Yeah. Um, really fun and easy to listen to. He and his, his uh, co-hosts are just really, they keep it light and fun. And all the stories are just weird enough. I think it's, <laughs> it's probably the easier to consume version of lore. I think it's probably the yeah. best way of, of saying that, but Jeff's awesome. He's going to be our first guest, but going back to how we're going to be organizing and delivering future episodes, it's, we're going to be telling our own stories before in like an early segment, just the two of us before we then move on to the uh, interview. And so more of our stories are going to be coming out 
But, um, you know, again, you should go to whatsyourghoststory.com and maybe even, Scott, you could try pulling some of the recent stories if anybody, you know, submits something um, sure. and we can read them off, you know, in future episodes. This is kind of a blank slate for us. We're kind of, we're excited because most of the things that we're doing on a daily basis for our job and podcasts are very specific to screenwriting and that world and that storytelling uh, level, which we both love, but it's yeah. fun to get out in the, the, the no boundary land of um, just anything and everything. Yeah, and I really, uh, I've learned a lot. I've, I've grown a lot as far as uh, philosophy of not just storytelling, but of working in a community. I put a book out in 2003 independently, as did you, uh, Max, uh, independently at first. And we both, we were each lucky enough to, uh, not lucky enough, we worked for it. Um, you can find a publisher <laughs> yeah. that would then later put out our books again. Uh, but when my book first came out, it was it, it generated such a wonderful community of people online that would then come out and share their stories and share their own independent research and share information. And a community was grown. And that's why I love working with the ISA. They are all about building a community, too. As a writer, it's hard to have a community a lot of times. So they do things like the Third Thursdays meetups. But the, you know, the website in general and for me putting my website and my information out there, it's all about sharing information, sharing personal history, stories, uh, just putting yourself out there and people sharing it. And, and when I was able to then have my book re-released five years later, it was 100 pages longer just because so much more new sure. information was delivered yeah. to my doorstep. Yeah. And the product was so much better. And I was so much more proud of it. Uh, well, so more that's, often you're writing and telling stories. It's impossible not to improve. Uh, yeah. You're always going to get a little bit better. When I'm talking to my writers one-on-one, -on -one, I have a bunch of personal coaching clients that I have on the phone that we work on their projects and develop these things together. I'm always telling them you're, it's, it's literally impossible for you to get worse at this. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not you, you, everything that you write, you're going to improve just even a little bit. And the more you tell stories, the more you get a, a hang of the just the rhythm. Uh, I was very lucky to grow up with a dad who was just naturally a born storyteller. And so I, th I was kind of ingrained in this idea of how to tell a story, what really gets people jazzed up. And so I, you know, pursued that. <clears throat> and we that's what I do with my writers on a one on one basis, pursue this level of momentum and energy and rhythm and what is exciting and fun about just telling a story in general. So we're going to be picking some fantastic ones. Before we go on and, and to, uh, I just keep this lo getting longer and longer as we're trying to make it shorter. <laughs> um, what was it, uh, if you can talk a little bit about the decision to start to go into helping other people write and maybe a favorite story you've had on a success of you know, like the personal fulfillment of helping somebody else write. Well, for one, I kind of fell into the educational level of the screenwriting world because I, I ended up taking a, a professional program called Writer's Boot Camp, um, which I took as a student, went through the two year program and I eventually worked, started working for the company. And that was purely because I just needed a freaking job. Like I was broke. Yeah needed a job. They offered me one. I'm like, cool, I can work in the industry that I actually studied in college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very few artists can actually say that. So I started working there. And um, very long story short, after six years, I found that I just became so educated because I was constantly talking to other writers about how, how to improve their craft. I was, I was teaching live classes with them. I, I took on some of our A-list clients in terms of working with them one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, I was lucky in that the boss, the person who ran the company, he kept me in on most of, if not all of the meetings he had. So I had kind of a crash course in business and acumen yeah. and all those things. And so it's, I, I knew out of college, I wanted to pursue producing and screenwriting. And I ended up doing that. It was just from a different angle. And I'm still writing and still working. And I've just become that much stronger of someone who understands how story works, and then how to change it for your own devices. So when I work with my writers, you know, I think the the best thing is this is the small moments, of course, when they win contests, or they get repped, like one of my writers that I've worked with since writers bootcamp, which was 2000. 11, 10, um, one, not f every year for the last nine years, but she and I have kept in touch for the past two years. We, we've been on the phone virtually every week. She got rep by a major agent, you know, so that's cool. And it's yeah, great. It's great. It's, 
it's kind of like the beginning of her the next step of her career. But I love those moments when I'm explaining, you know, with, you know, in context of their own per- story that they're trying to tell and saying, here's why this moment is important and how it's then connected to other characters and how it lives within structure and, you know, act breaks and things. And you can just tell by their reaction. They're, they're like, I get it now kind of moment. Yeah. And the the light bulb. Yeah. There was a light bulb moment. Like the puzzle was just finished, you know, (laughs) still got a ton of work to do, (laughs) but you just kind of get this feeling of, I think they don't need me anymore. Not that I'm like some epic mentor that I can pass my children on to the future or whatever, but it doesn't say epic mentor on your business card. (laughs) (laughs) Right, (laughs) Obi-Wan story (laughs) consultant. No, I think that's where it comes from. And, and, you know, I learned myself just through writing my own book. It's called the wish keeper about the 16 year old, uh, fairy with shredded wings. Like you said, as I edited the second edition, so to speak, and as I'm writing the second and third books now, I I can tell that my writing is just so much stronger. Mm. Uh, not only the words on the page, but just how you craft a sentence. And then I or, arrange the, the uh, chapters. And yeah, I'm very proud of the first book, but it needed some work. It probably still does. <laughs> but it's still fun and people enjoy it. And that's really the whole point. That's awesome. I mean, how to finish the, this episode. I, the fun thing is, is that we don't really know. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. I, uh, we, we got to talk about uh, what's your ghost story.com and I'm using that opportunity to say it again. Uh, oh. But uh, people should check out the story farm if they are in, in, in the, in the need for an I epic mentor. The, the story farm is one way to go. You can go to storyfarm.org, but I also have an online course on storytelling and screenwriting called the craft course.com. It's 99 bucks for a 12 week full development class. We got audio lessons, written lectures, uh, video, $99. It's I, it, this is probably a $500 class, but I, it's, we have such a wide range of writers through the international screenwriters association and the story farm that it's like, let's just make this accessible. So 99 bucks and you can keep it for life. You can just apply the lessons over and over to multiple projects. But yeah, you should check storyfarm.org, what's your uh, ghost story.com, the craft course.com, network isa.org. You should also look at Jeff Belanger's um, podcast, uh, New England Legends, because we're going to have him on next time. And these podcasts are going to come out at pretty much twice a, m- a month. It kind of depends because we're into this Halloween season right now. So we might try to take advantage of the season. But I don't know. I think that our first episode was at least fun to do dive into yeah absolutely so definitely follow on uh, itunes and uh, you can always find us over on network i say.org podcast uh, page yeah um, you can subscribe to us on the ios app we're really excited to get a whole bunch of guests we have some really fun lineups ahead jeff is going to be amazing listen to him follow us on social media because we're going to get you know facebook going for the fantastic story society we've got twitter and instagram coming it's coming soon if not already when you're listening to this and then of course you can follow scott at what's your your twitter scott it's it's uh, actually just my name, uh, Scott Marcus, but really Instagram because these creepy places are so visual. So oh, look yeah. for uh, What's Your Ghost Story over on Instagram. Cool. Yeah, I'm Instamax9 on Instagram, IMAX Tim on Twitter, um, whatever, guys. You know, you, you're listening to this. That's what we should be thankful for. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's always about building the community. So if you have ghost stories of your own you want to share with us, if you have writing questions of your own, I guess whether even if it's not a ghost story question, if it's not about a paranormal story that you're writing, uh, definitely it's all about the interaction. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for tuning into our first episode zero, man. This is our, our launch and uh, it's going to be fun to see how where this goes and thanks for listening and uh you know until next time tell some good stories <laughs>